Yeah. Thanks for joining us for the webinar today. Today we'll present our purif purification-free characterization of viruses. So what we're gonna see, we'll go over a little history of NanoView. What have we been up to? What is our core technology about and what markets do we already serve? And how are we gonna address the needs in the virus market? We'll take a deep dive into the technology we employed, the single nanoparticle analysis that we do with in terms of size, quantity, and biophysical characterization. We'll visit the Lentiview assay. This is our out-of-the-box assay for lentivirus applications. And then we'll stop in at virus engineering and assay customization. So ways that you can make this work for other virus types or viruses that you have changed the characteristics of and you can assess those new properties of, of the viral particles at the single virus level. And then we'll have a couple other considerations, little features of the kits and stop in for Q&A. So like I said at the start, if you have a question, you can drop it in the Q&A or the chat at the bottom and we'll go through all of them at the end. So a little background on NanoView as a company, founded in 2016 out of Professor Unlu's lab at Boston University. And this is the core technology of the platform is the single particle interferometric reflectance imaging sensor. So you'll hear the word interferometry throughout this. That's how we size the single nanoparticles that we're gonna capture on our array. And that's visualization of viruses and complex media in 2016. And then we have publications throughout 16 and 17 on different types of viruses. And then in 2017, exosomes and EVs. And that's actually what we've focused on as a company for the past few years is, is detecting extracellular vesicles. And that lends itself well to detecting viruses. And so in 2018, prototypes of this device started being sold to virology and exosome labs. And we launched in 2019 commercially serving mainly the extracellular vesicle characterization market or exosome market. And then we've been in Asia focusing on custom capture and biomarkers and now expanding those custom capabilities into what our Lentiview assay is and potentially other viral assays that use different captures, similar to the way we employ the system in EVs, but we're gonna actually find the interferometry for these Lentivirus is very valuable. So what does that look like in our technology deep dive? Let's focus at first on what the workflow looks like. So this is uh, a situation where you're gonna handle the samples. You can easily run up to 24 samples in a single sample load, stain and wash. So step one, 24 samples can go into that process all at once. And we're gonna see exactly how you load them onto our immuno capture chips in the next few slides. But after they're done processing there, which is a largely hands-off process, it does most of the work for you. you. Some of the parts where you can customize the assay, you'll still be involved. And then you take those now, process dried chips and you simply place them in the automated reader in step two. And this is fully automated. Once you tell it what chips you've placed, you can walk away while it collects the data for you. And then analysis and report generation with powerful software for analyzing these complex data sets of single nanoparticles carrying multiple different fluorescent signals and all with independent size information from the interferometry. So a surface view of the loading is, is the chip. The core of the technology is the single chip. And these are a single use chip that can come functionalized out of the box to you with a microarray on it. And the microarrays look mostly antibody arrays, but other types of captures can mediate binding too. And during the sample incubation stage, which is step one, all we're gonna do is take out a, a chip, which is here we see placed on top of a thumb drive. And down on that chip is a multi-spot array of different types of captures. So, in the Lentiview assay, we're gonna see our anti-BSVG capture row in the dark blue is the primary uh, spot of interest in this presentation. It's going to, during the incubation, which we start up by loading the sample on the chip in this way, and this is just exemplary so we can see it, we blot on about 50 microliters of mostly diluted sample, something around 10 to the eighth particles per ml uh, of intact virus is a good starting point. And, when they're down there binding during the incubation stage, they'll go interact with that virus specific capture spot. And then we'll characterize those particles that have bound for the additional signals with the rest of the assay. Practically on the bench, we talked about the chip washer and we talked about how to use it. So let's spend a couple minutes here looking at the assay hands-on. So this is our chip washer plate. We, this is how we can process up to 24 samples together. We'd lay out 24 chips in the trays and then load on our 24 samples, just like we saw in the previous slide. And then we see the little ramp. So the little ramp is how we're gonna get them dry. They're gonna lay flat in the well, as we're gonna see. We'll load up the sample. And then the very last thing we'll do is pull the chips up the ramp 
in a simple underwater step. And then the, the washer will remove the liquid, leaving us with dry chips ready to be scanned and stained. So this is the only step of the assay where you'll really handle the chips fresh out of the pack. You're laying them out in the uh, tray and you're getting them ready to put on samples. You take out one for every sample you have. And these come pre-functionalized, so they're ready to use. You put them in the reader, pre-scan them to remove any background signal particles. There aren't very many, but pre-scanning them will enhance the, the post-scan data. And then with them loaded in the tray lane nice and flat, just check out the alignment, and then we're gonna load up our samples right on top of the chips. Samples are really responsive in general to other orthogonal techniques. If you have a good idea what is in the samples, then you can usually be very predictive based on other measurements of how much material you need to load into the NanoView assay. And like I said, 50 microliters of something between one times 10 to the sixth and one times 10 to the eighth expected particles of interest is a good rate range to load onto the chip to get nice resolved images and really clear separation of the empty, full, fragment type particles that we're going to see discussed in the next few slides as we look at the data from the asset. So loading up the samples is pretty simple. And in this, we're going to do a one hour incubation. So we take, load the samples up, and then one hour later, we're going to put them in the washer. And it's only going to take about three hours to get data from anywhere from one to 24 samples. So it doesn't add a lot of time to run more than one sample, but a single sample takes about the same time as running the rest. So utilize that uh, available time so that you can maximize the productivity of the instrument. The buffer usage of running one sample, not really consequential. You have to run, run one strip. So like I've loaded four here and we're gonna wait our one hour, incubate. And then all we're gonna do is take the samples right on the chips and we're gonna set them right into the plate washer. And after this stage, we're only gonna have a couple interactions with them to load in other reagents, mainly for customization. So I close up the lid, I choose a protocol, we have several available, they all come preloaded. You can customize them too for other you know, multi-staining applications. So I'll just pick a basic protocol. First strip's gonna start. I only wanna run the top strip, so I tell it one strip, and then I hit start. And we can walk away at this point, and a few minutes later, it's gonna ask you to add this fluorescent antibody solution. Now this is left for you so that you can customize what you wanna stain. We're gonna see later, we have three fluorescent staining channels and a fourth in the R200 plus that you can bring in to stain any antibody driven detection method that you want on those particles that you've captured on the chip during the incubation stage. So you, you just blot in the staining antibodies here. And if you wanna run any controls, this is you control what goes into the detection channels in this step. So unstained, you just simply don't add the dyes to that well. We hit continue and then walk away for a little while here as it does its shaking and final washes. And then we're gonna come back after about 90 minutes and we're gonna find it asking us to move the chips up the ramp. That's just simply moving them under the water up the ramp. And then it dries them off and out they pop, ready to go in the scanner. Once we've loaded them in the chuck, the chuck's a little carrier that this holds them flat and level in the scanner so that it scans them properly. And loading them up is a simple process you'll see here. Very easy. They're in the chuck, they go in the scanner, and that's it. So once they're in the scanner, how do we measure the particle size on those little chips? What's going on? It's a single particle interferometry method. So on the chip beforehand, we scan the antibody spot to identify any interference signal from it. And once the nanoparticles are found, we rescan the spot and their contrast signal after the light's reflected down into the center of the chip and back up it drives the call out of the nanoparticle size that they have. And this is largely a mass driven technique. The more mass that's in the spot, the larger the particle size that will be reported. So we can sense these with high resolution and this is optimized in this setup for performance over a range of 50 to 200 nanometers. And the literature on this technique is fairly rich from the UNLU lab at BU. When we look at virus sizing, there's a few different things that we'll see particularly between the fragments, the foals, and the empty viruses. Over on the left, we see our normal particle sizing curve. So this is the response of the instrument in contrast on the y-axis to potential particle sizes. And then in the middle, we see 
mixed beads. So a contrived sample where we have closely spaced nanoparticles mixed in roughly equal amounts on the same chip area. And in the single field of view, we can easily resolve the quantity and size distribution of these different beads in high resolution using this interferometric imaging technique. And then when we look at viruses, we actually don't usually find them to be strongly multimodal and also EVs and all of our EV work for all, for all the time people spend talking about resolution and sizing techniques for EVs, all of our data that samples thousands and thousands of individual EVs shows that the distributions are smooth and continuous. And when we look at full virus particles, we find something different. The distribution becomes normal about some mean size that's acceptable for our lentivirus or viral particle near 100 nanometers. And the empty viruses will be slightly smaller because they don't contain the mass of the capsid. And this distribution turns down, but in other situations, we can actually have the size distribution turn up and indicate that there are many fragmented or, or vesicle-like particles that don't contain the inside. And we're gonna see that in more detail as we go on here. So we have the ability to resolve those empty full single virus particles plus size them. And we detect the empty and full aspects through biomarker co-localization. So we use fluorescent detection after the capture stage. So we have a picture of a vesicle here, but you could imagine this is an empty envelope and it doesn't have an inside. And it's captured based on the bottom antibody. So that in the lentiview acid will be our VSVG. And then we can detect other markers and trained on the virus and inside it in up to four available colors. And standard, we're gonna use two. We're gonna stain the VSVG. And we're gonna stain the P24 as we'll see but it provides four color detection. And as a simple challenge to the, to the machine, we can put in four color beads, which make a very simple example of what if the answer for the sample was that it's homogenous, that it is full of normally distributed particles about one size, and that all those particles contain all of the biomarkers I'd like to stain, that their signal is positive in all four channels. So we have several readouts that come out of the software very naturally, the, the upper left is a typical size on the x-axis, fluorescence intensity on the y, that shows each of the four color channels independently, intensity versus size. And we can see that the size call out is highly correlated with the intensity and it should be. So we've got nice resolved sizing, good fluorescence intensity detection. We can see those intensities sprayed in a dot plot in the lower left. And then one of the most common reports from our system is, is our pie charts that show the different types of particles that show up on the spot. And we'll see these, can look very different in other situations, but here with the beads that are positive for everything, there's only one of the possible, all this rainbow of phenotypes that could be present, only really the white one, the one that's positive for all four is present in the pie chart. So all the particles of the 842 individual single nanoparticles that measured in these beads, all of them were virtually positive for all four markers. So what is that going to help you do in these virus laden samples? So that combination of phenotyping and particle sizing is going to allow for discrimination of intact virus at relatively low concentration. So they don't need to be a majority of the population of nanoparticles in the sample, even compared to EVs. And so your low purity samples here are welcome. And when we leverage this size and multi-marker staining, it allows this subpopulation or these different populations of fragments, holes, and empties to be quantified in detail for their size distribution and count which can then be calibrated to active titer or tracked against other orthogonal methods, giving you a really nice picture of what the state of the virus particles is and how that relates to your other methods of understanding their activity. So that's the assay, the Lentiview assay that we're releasing here and the Lentiview kit. So along with your washer reader, you receive a kit box in the mail. The kit comes with 16 of the test chips like we saw in it. And this is a specialized kit designed for use with that platform. So you have the washer, reader, and then these are the disposable kits uh, that you order. And the configuration here is our capture is going to be on VSVG standard. And then we have a nice type control. And then I've noted in italics the Viroflex here. Those are going to, we're going to touch on later. Those are custom spots where you can make the chip capture other markers of interest or other things you'd like to measure. And then the secondary fluorescent antibodies, the biomarker detection ones, we're gonna provide a labeled anti-VSVG. We're gonna see that in the blue channel throughout this presentation and anti-P24 for the capsid staining in the red channel throughout this presentation. The additional two channels, we're gonna utilize one, the green in some of these examples to stain additional markers. And, the other, and in general, they're open for your use here. What are the benefits of, of this method really are? You can, you can have rapid characterization of the virus, about a three hour process to have the chips ready to scan with 
or without purification. So all throughout the processing streams, you're getting data that it can be predictive for transduction efficiency, providing a rapid and actionable feedback loop. You're getting an easy way to collect data on the state of the virus. Biophysical characterization is size and titer alongside this proteomic information or additional markers and quantitative pseudotype characterization. And you can really customize this assay when you want it to pull down other things of interest. And we'll see how, what components those could be later on here. So when we're talking about full and empty capsids in this assay, I wanna be a little more clear about what we, what we think of. And so in a cartoon setting here, we see the left image where we clearly see pink particles. We see blue overlaying red making pink. And we're sizing the particles independently, but at a basic level on the capture spot, we expect the particle can come down. And what we're gonna call the holes here are those that are detectable for size. So they show us that they're a particle in the interference mode. And then they stay in the inside for P24 and are captured by the VSVG and also either fluoresce for VG or are captured there and have a size. Those are gonna be the intact ones. And we're gonna find that there's other types of species like particles that are smaller, not detectable, but contain the envelope. The capsid protein we find is almost always in these intact particles. So with this empty versus full versus fragments, for any single bound nanoparticle, the nanoview system reports the size of the particle through the interference microscopy from 50 to 200 nanometers. The particles bind to the VSPG on the chip, and then through the fluorescent detection, we'll determine whether they contain P24 within the particle, giving rise to the full count. And the P24 signal shows strong overlap with these IM particles. For the empty particles, we can consider a couple different things. We can consider those that are positive for size, so they're in the sizable range, and display VSVG, so they're captured there or stained for it, but they're seen without uh, the P24 inside them. And then what we can think of more, maybe more as fragments, these are smaller pieces still that are not sized, they don't report an IM, but we can see that the fluorescent signals are sitting together, either the VSVG staining on the same spot or additional markers stain on the same spot, but lack the P24 staining and lacking a size. So predictive transduction efficiency in this experiment, a wild type lenti vector was modified with an engineered targeting ligand. So additional protein to aid in the way it interacts with cells. Two different plasmid concentrations were used to try and modify the amount of this additional protein that's incorporated into the vector. And then physical virus titers and a functional titer were measured and it's clear here that the P24 titers weren't predictive of the performance of the vector. So we can look across the first row in the table and see that we have all within a couple fold result for the P24 ELISA. And then the functional titers are spread out over about three orders of magnitude. And we see that plot on the left. These are behaving very differently in their activity. And then the ratio of those two covers a couple orders of magnitude between the very low activity, high concentration ETL and the wild type level of activity. So when we do the lenti view assay, when we bind our particles to the VSVG spot, and then we probe them with the antifluorescent P24 and the antifluorescent VSVG, and we look at in relation to the fragments and in relation to the fulls and empties based on size, both trends show that the wild type has more intact virus than fragments, and that those of those virus, many are full, 43%, and that by the time we're in this low transduction situation, only 8% of the virus are full, and a majority of the material is now in the fragment state, or it, it doesn't have P24, it's not sizable, and the intact particles only have 10% of them showing as full of P24. And this correlates nicely here with the functional titer, and is easy to accomplish in that simple assay we saw back in the first results, where you just add your stains and read out the data. For viral titer in terms of, can I take the number of events I see on the spot or that phenotype and turn it into how many were in the solution that was incubated over the chip? We can provide that physical type of titer against a known particle standard like 100 nanometer beads or against an orthogonal assay, if you like, by, by calibrating against an orthogonal method. For the standard 100 nanometer bead method, we pass those beads over an SEC column and remove any free biotin. And then we measure by NTA how many hard beads there are. And then we calibrate that particle count based on a dilution series. And that calibration results in a calibration factor for taking the number of objects that bind the spot and turning it into per mil. And that calibration doesn't need to be performed by you. That's a data display that can be turned on. 
there's little difference in those counts when we have different types of capture media. Well, so antibiotin versus streptavidin for pulling them down. So the surface counts at, in this assay are mainly driven by avidity and not the antibody affinity. So you, we use that bead method to calibrate. And then when we look at the number of counts we get versus the dilution of the same P24 series correlates nicely with the result in the same samples dilution series between the counts we have for the full particle types, the empty particle types, the overall particles, and the P24 content. So it dilutes linearly with that. How can you extend this into customized situations or virus engineering outside of the standard assay and measuring the empty folds? The first way is with our Viroflex chips. So these are customized for virus characterization. You get two extra spots on, on these chips and they are ready to receive two antibodies of your choice that you bind to linkers with simple chemistry that's included in the kit. So Viroflex 1 and 2 are on the chip. You conjugate any custom capture antibody shown in the pink antibody molecule here to protein linker 1 or 2, and then you functionalize that chip by binding it onto the chip. Then you do the normal procedure we saw back in the video. You bind the, vi you bind the viruses, you label them with your markers of interest, and then the readout's totally normal, goes in the same reader, and you just interpret those Viroflex spots in terms of your new capture molecule you put there. So simple way here mainly to test other markers while not using tons of chips. So you can get these kits and test out a couple. And then what most of our users do is take the pink antibody and then they send it to us and they have it printed on in our custom chips. And then the custom chips come to them ready to use out of the pack, just like we saw in the video where you tear the pack open, the antibodies are already in place and you don't need to do any additional prep work to have the chips ready to use for you. The flex assays themselves, when you prepare those chips, if you do over and over, have excellent reproducibility and dilution linearity. Those spots are responsive to dilution in the same way our typical spots are. You dilute the sample, less binding on the spot, less fluorescent signal, less counting, normal. The reproducibility of them over repetitions of making the chips functionalize, also very good. So what about the use of those other fluorescent channels where we can look at additional proteins that may be incorporated into the particles, into the virus, or may influence the ability of the virus to form completely. So a closer look at the interaction of the engineered targeting ligand. So we, there we have an antibody uh, in our ETL, and we have an antibody for BSVG. And then we have the capture antibody for BSVG. And we can sense the fragments versus the whole particles or the sizable particles based on the interferometry. And this is the same set of data, but we link this size aspect to the proteomic display. So where those markers are in the virus, full virus particles or the fragments. And that's what actually drives this lent view virus versus fragments measurement. And that in the inductive sample, we see most of the signal, 63% of the signal from both of the markers is in the particles that fall into the size range or are seemingly intact. And as we tend to the not as infectious sample, we trend into the more fragmented state that most of those extra surface markers and envelope proteins are showing up in things that are smaller than 50 nanometers stuck to the chip and do not have a size, even if they are, as we show in the cartoon, showing up seemingly on the same particle. So this is a good way to check out how a new protein that you want to be displayed on the envelope or on the virus itself? Is it affecting the formation of the virus? Is it leading to other particles entering the mix that don't have the same capabilities as the wild type? So a good way to assess where it is, where's that protein going and how much of it's being displayed. What about envelope versus non-envelope virus? The lentibu assay is tuned for VSBG capture and lenti, but the concept, just like we talked about with the Bioflex chip, is that any Sample you want to use here, particularly viruses that are nominally bigger than 50 nanometers. These are the same on both sides for enveloped and non-enveloped. No purification, physical titer, virus size and aggregation down to 20 nanometers very soon, pseudotype characterization, and then user customizability. So whether it's enveloped or non-enveloped, if you have a good targeting molecule to capture your virus of interest with, you can utilize the flex chips to do this type of measurement and to size the particles see what types of proteins they hold, and sense whether they're intact or fragmented. With the non-envelope viruses, detecting the 
genomic material is, is not something that is currently available, but the detection of multiple proteins and size definitely is. So what other things might we consider about this assay as we're, as we're getting ready to use it? What about the P24? So we see that there's a, a fraction of the virus particles on VSVG that contain the P24 signal. In most situations alongside that, especially out of media, we'll find that there's, if we capture on P24, so right alongside our VSVG capture on our cartoon chip here, we go ahead and capture based on P24. So this would be capturing seemingly capsid protein and then staining for it with our fluorescent anti-P24, interacting with the same spots, we find that a lot, a majority of this P24 that's sensed is already soluble in the media, in the separations, and the P24 capture here can be used alongside the VSVG and even the tetraspanins to start to track the viral particles, the EVs, and the soluble P24 throughout your processing of these types of samples or the preparation of this from a type of cell supernatant into something that you can use and quantify and characterize. Speaking of those EVs, vesicle contamination, you know, is this something that's present in purified samples? So when purifying viruses, uh, extracellular vesicles from the cell supernatant on will often co-purify because of their size and density in many techniques. They just overlap really strongly. And when you look at this from the particle counting perspective, you can never really differentiate just by sizing or looking at how many particles there are, whether they are in fact contaminating EVs, filled capsids, empty capsids, or some mixture in between, which is what is usually taking place, is that it's a big mixture. And the goal here in this brief experiment was to distinguish EVs and eliminate their presence through purification in the final product. And this lentiview assay can be easily modified to include these common exosomal EV markers, CD9, CD63, and CD81. And then purified and non-purified samples can be easily assessed as their relative proportions of viruses and contaminating exosomes or EVs. And we've spent the past three years commercializing this platform for distinctly detecting extracellular vesicles. So we're particularly experienced in characterizing EVs from all different types of samples. Um, for both therapeutic, diagnostic, and basic biology use um, all around the world. So at that point, you can really get to fully characterizing the nanoparticles of interest in terms of their size, count or titer, empty full ratio or intact fragmented ratio, and at the same time, look at the removal of EV fractions that are not desired with the viruses in a simple and rapid assay. And so what do we find if we capture EVs on the VSVG spot? Is the v, does the envelope protein end up with EVs? Does it end up in fragments? When we stain the tetraspanin, so we've done the same experiment here. We've used the four color channels. So we've got the P24 in red still. We've got the VSVG in pink, the NIR, which is actually far red. Our ETL is in green and we've turned that off here. And we have our tetraspanins labeling in blue. And depending on the method of purification, the growth conditions, the stage of the purification process, Vesicles can make up a significant portion of purified particles when you do a particle counting perspective of how many particles I have. And we see that in the chart. There's a lot of tetraspanin staining in this particular sample on the VSVG capture spot. Some of it is incorporated in particles, but when we talk about vesicles, we're gonna go with those that are just tetraspanin only. They don't co-localize on the P24 protein. So they don't appear to be entrained on the virus surface. You will find a fraction of the virus do display a tetraspanin of interest on their surface because it's enveloped in the cell membrane. The tetraspanins do show frequent incorporation to virus particles, but the ones that are alone, the seemingly vesicle type particles with no content, those are easily quantified separately and you can analyze that. Little fraction of EVs alongside your virus and interesting particles. And then coming soon, we'll be having AAV detection. So same method, same chips, same reader, the label free, image, the interferometry will be able to sense the particles down to 20 nanometers and give you the result and size distribution on the right. And then the fluorescent labeling works the same as the others. And the current assay can provide size distribution and count of those particles based on the surface staining without purification very easily. And further developments required to further understand the full and empty ratio by other staining or detection methods. And that's due out later this year. So we're wrapping up. 
revisit the instrument, the XOVR200, providing you that size, titer, and phenotype capability, the biophysical characterization of the single virus particle. So size, counts, extra marker detection on single viruses in this high throughput and automated system. There's no purification required. Crude cell culture, drug substances, any process stream along the way welcome in this system and minimal sample volume. Those you don't, you never need more than 50 microliters and oftentimes you need just a couple microliters to be getting really nice data surrounding characterizing thousands of single virus particles from your mixture. And this full empty ratio via CAPSA detection provides you some actionable data in process development and as to vector performance and additional particles that may be moving through the separations with you. We will directly follow up with all the requests that are received in the poll. And if anyone has anything they'd like to follow up about independently, you can contact us to reach your regional, regional representative at 1-781-365-849, nanoviewbio.com or info at nanoviewbio.com. So thank you again for taking time today to join me and I'll look forward to the next time we're meeting.